right. Now, audible prayer for all to say. Please say this out loud. Lord, today in a submitted spirit, I ask you to use these scriptures to change my life, to convict me of sin, and to change my attitudes and my heart within. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Here's our introduction. In Isaiah 34, we see a picture of the Great Tribulation, specifically the Battle of Armageddon. Therefore, it's as if in truth and honesty, God says, yes, I am going to heal all sickness and forgive all iniquity. Yes, I'm going to bring quietness and peace to the city of Jerusalem, but there's going to be something else happening before my kingdom comes. Now, remember, the Christian church at this point has been raptured away. And any of those who um, were not believers during the end of this period have been taken to hell. So this is the period of time. Tribulation has occurred. Uh, we're at the end of the tribulation. Uh, the non-believing sinners have been taken to hell. And this is the condition of the earth uh, after the tribulation period or the, um, uh, the battle of Armageddon, which is the final battle uh, where Jesus comes back to earth and he eliminates all of those who have uh, taken up arms against him. He is going to annihilate the Antichrist at this moment. Uh, and this is the desolation of the earth as a result of the Battle of Armageddon. Now, this chapter is in contradiction to the philosophy of the world. You see, man expects to improve the world by his own efforts so that he can build a utopia. He plans to bring in a millennium, although he may call it something else. Man thinks he's capable of lifting himself up by his own bootstraps. We've all heard that. Oh, you got to lift yourself up by your own bootstraps. you got to make something happen. Look, there is no uh, improving of the earth, right? We keep saying, boy, things are getting, getting pretty bad. Well, they're going to continue to get bad. That's what the Bible tells us is it's not going to get better. It's going to get continually worse until Jesus comes back and restores the earth. And then we dwell and reign with him on this planet for a thousand years during the millennial reign of Christ. So when we look at what's going on and transpiring, well, yes, it's discouraging. Uh, and, and you know, it's hard to watch, especially here in America, to watch what our founding fathers did in building a nation on a foundation of God. I mean, it still says on our money, in God we trust, yet as a nation, we have never trusted God less than we do now. And I'm referring to the percentages of the number of people who claim or call themselves Christians, uh, the millennial generation. The millennial kids, those born after 1981, uh, that millennial generation is the least believing generation uh, since we've started tracking this going back to uh, the 1920s. Uh, the millennials are the least believing generation. Only 49% of them believe that there's a God, believe in God, follow and walk with God. So 49%. Now, the reason for that is that 63% of their parents, uh, those born, I believe it's 1970 to 1981 or 1969, the generation X, uh, it's because that's my generation. Uh, we didn't raise our millennial kids to walk with the Lord. And so now, because we, Generation X, didn't do a great job raising our kids in, in things of the Lord, they, of course, are not going to raise their kids in the things of the Lord. So the next generation after the millennials, uh, I would imagine we're going to see a similar decline. It'll go from 49% of the millennials down to probably 35 or 30% of their kids who deny Christ. Now, the reason that's so scary is these are the future generations that are going to be going into politics. So as we look at the midterm elections coming up on November 8th, hopefully you all have voted uh, we always do our mail-in ballots, so we have voted, um, but you've got to be looking for candidates that are walking with the Lord. We have a candidate here running for the Senate, and a uh, strong believer. I saw a commercial that she put out yesterday where she put her kids on TV. You know, say what you will about using kids for marketing, but, you know, here's, here's a woman that's wanting to make change, has a family, and is saying, you know what, I can raise my family and make a positive difference. So she's run for Senate, and I hope she wins. That would be fantastic. Um, but if we don't, as a Christian community, if we don't get the word out, if we are not bold in sharing Christ with anyone and everyone we can, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse, because now we're going to have non-believing politicians. And while we, yes, have a lot of them already, Imagine when it's the greater majority, you know, thank the Lord, we still have a lot of believers in politics, but 
man, can you imagine what this world would look like if we were completely devoid of them? Now, the challenge with non-believers in politics is they truly believe that their success is up to them, uh, that creating and carving out a nation that 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 they want to see, you know, one where uh, everything that God has specifically said don't do, it seems like the non-believing uh, political parties want to do just that. They want to make abortion legal. They want to make uh, marriage between somebody other than a man and a woman legal. They want to see, you know, all of these things uh, completely against what God says. So man thinks he is capable of lifting himself up by his own bootstraps. Now, the basic philosophy of evolution, uh, and evolution, by the way, is a philosophy, not a science, is that there is improvement as we go along. Well, you know, evolution, right? We, we just keep getting better and better and better. Uh, in fact, you guys have heard this slogan. Every day, in every way, I am getting better and better and better. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. Man has woven this philosophy into the fabric of life, and he thinks we're moving into something which is great and good. But the Word of God also looks forward to a wonderful future for this earth, but it is not the consummation of man's efforts. Everything that man has built apart from God is going to come under a frightful judgment. All of man's work is contrary to God and must come into a final conflict. Now, that conflict is what is set before us here as the battle of Armageddon. The sin of man will finally be headed up into the man of sin who will attempt, that's the Antichrist, who will attempt to bring in a kingdom for himself. And that kingdom is what is being destroyed during the Great Tribulation period. It can only be ended with the coming of Christ to the earth to establish his kingdom. So, in short... We keep looking for things to improve, but everything we read in the Bible says that things are actually going to continually get worse, not better. Now, I don't want to be Debbie Downer here, right? We want to, oh, let's think positive. Let's be positive. Okay, let's do that, but let's do it knowing truth. And the truth is, is that the political parties are going to continue to get worse. Uh, there will be, you know, sparks of light as, as Christians are, are uh, voted into office. But I just pray that as these Christians get voted into office, that they understand the importance of their platform is not so much to change public policy, which is going to continue going down a downward trend, but rather to use the platform to share and preach Christ. Okay? The importance here, you guys, is that the, the storm is going to come. There's nothing we can do to stop it. But what we can do is we can warn people before the storm hits that it's coming, and we can help them get prepared by sharing Jesus with them, by encouraging them to accept him as Lord and Savior, by, by teaching the Bible and helping them to understand that there is hope for an eternal future, but it's not a hope of utopia on this planet, um, at least until Jesus is ruling and reigning in Jerusalem during the millennial reign, but rather that it is through a relationship with Jesus Christ that we have the promise of this blessed future. So uh, let's jump into verse number one here which says, come near you nations and listen, pay attention, you people. This is God saying, hey, listen up. This is going to happen. You know, for those who say that God is, is uh, unloving or unkind, or you've all heard the statement, how could a God of love, you know, bring on such destruction and torment to his own creation, mankind? Well, he's giving us warnings. I mean, this entire Bible is filled with warnings that this is coming. It's not, it's not like shocking news. It's coming. I mean, Isaiah wrote this thousands and thousands of years ago. And yet here we're reading it again, being warned that this is going to happen. Verse 2. Why is it going to happen? Because the Lord is angry with all nations. His wrath is upon their armies. He will totally destroy them, and he will give them over to slaughter. Now, in Isaiah 1-2, God called heaven and earth to witness his judgment upon his people Israel. So if you guys go back to Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 2, hang a left, and just look at Isaiah chapter 1. In verse 2, it says this, Hear, O heavens, listen, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. Now, here in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2, God is calling all heavens to listen. Okay, so that's when God's cleaning up the heavens by eliminating Satan and all of his fallen angels. So God's cleaned up heaven. Now he is saying, listen up, O earth, here in verse 2. The Lord is angry with all nations. So nations listen up because God is calling the nations of the earth to witness his final judgment. 
Now, Revelation chapter 14, verse 20 tells us that at the battle of Armageddon, the blood will flow as high as a horse's bridle. Uh, and for those of you going to Jerusalem with us, you will stand over the valley of Megiddo, which is this beautiful, lush green. It stretches for thousands of acres of ground. It's It's got mountains that surround it. It's just this massive valley. Uh, and this is where millions upon millions and millions of soldiers all coming from the south and the east and the uh, the north, Russia descending, China descending, all descending into Israel in this valley of Megiddo is where this great war will be staged and take place. So Revelations 14, 20 tells us that there will be so much blood as a result of this battle that it'll literally look like an ocean or a lake of blood that will come up to the horse's bridle. So think about a horse's draw, jawline. That's how much blood there will be as a result of this battle. Now, Jeremiah chapter 30 refers to this period of time as Jacob's trouble. For in the tribulation, Jacob, which is a reference to the nation of Israel, will be shaken to its core, and God summons the whole world to judgment at this climax of history. Now, Jacob's trouble is because the Jewish nation has refused to acknowledge that Jesus is the Messiah. So Jacob, uh, God's promise to Jacob, whose name was turned to Israel, the children of Israel are Jacob. This is Jacob's trouble uh, because they refuse to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Now, here's the good news, okay? Before this final battle, during the tribulation period, the seven-year tribulation period, it is believed that more people will get saved during that period than in the thousand years before it. So God is faithful, God is just, and he's going to continue uh, to, to shout it from the rooftops that this judgment is coming, and a lot of people will come to accept Christ during this, this seven-year period. Now, they will all be killed for their belief in Jesus, uh, so they will be martyrs, but they will be saved, you know, and I think that that's encouraging, uh, because a lot of people who, who have, want nothing to do with Jesus right now in today's day and age, right where you are, um, they're going to get saved, uh, many of them, and so I want to, I want that to be an encouragement to all of us, that, you know, you've got friends and family, and you're thinking there's no way they're ever going to get saved, well, I believe that there's still hope, but we need to be praying about them. We need to be uh, ministering to them. We need to be witnessing to them um, and, and tell them about the love of Jesus and this coming judgment period. Now, observe closely the words that are used here in verse 2. Uh, some of your, your translations use the word indignation, uh, the word furry or fury, or the, the term utterly destroyed or delivered to the slaughter. Uh, mine says his wrath, totally destroy, give them over to slaughter. I mean, this is a pretty strong language. Now, the judgment here is universal, and it's severe. It's not the only time of Jacob's trouble, however, Jeremiah 30, verse 7, but it is the time of earth's trouble. Now, our Lord spoke of this as a time of suffering that will be unparalleled in the history of the world. The seals, trumpets, and vials in the book of Revelation all intensify and confirm this. If you guys haven't read the book of Revelation, do so, and go read about the seven judgment bowls being poured out on the earth, and you can see all of the things that lead up to this tribulation period. Now, whether you believe it or not, the earth is moved toward the judgment of God. And instead of a wonderful day coming for sinful man, a time of judgment is coming. And as we look around at our contemporary civilization, everything that we see is going to come under the judgment of our almighty God. Now, verse three says this, their slain will be thrown out, their dead bodies will send up a stench, and the mountains will be soaked in blood. Wow. J. Vernon McGee said this specifically about verse 3. He said, this description is to me the most terrible and repulsive description in the entire Bible. He says, I can't think of anything worse than this. It confirms that the Lord Jesus said when he was here and what the book of Revelation teaches about coming judgment upon this earth. Their slain will be thrown out. Their dead bodies will send up stench. Guys, millions, hundreds of millions of people. In fact, at that point, the earth will probably be uh, 7 billion, uh, and it is believed that during this period, uh, two-thirds of the world's population will be wiped out. Think about that. So 7, 8 billion, 9 billion, however many people are on earth during this time, but two-thirds of them gone. So we're talking 2, 3, 4 
5 billion people dead and their carcasses, their dead bodies just laying around. Unbelievable. Verse four, and all the stars of the heavens will be dissolved and the sky rolled up like a scroll. All the starry hosts will fall like withered leaves from the vine, like shriveled figs from the fig tree. Now, Ray Comfort had this in his, um, in his study Bible, He's, and he titled this, If God Could Be Eternal, So Could the Universe? Question mark. Ray said this, To deal with the dilemma of God and his eternal nature, atheists will often claim that the universe can also be without beginning, abandoning their own accepted science or philosophy. Now, according to scientist Stephen Hawking, all the evidence seems to indicate that the universe has not existed forever. Rather, the universe and time itself had a beginning called the Big Bang. Stephen Hawking goes on to explain, in fact, the theory that the universe has existed forever is in serious difficulty with the second law of thermodynamics. The second law states that disorder always increases with time. Think about this. Stephen Hawking said this. The order, uh, or the human progress, or that disorder always increases with time. So it doesn't get better. Chaos decreases with time, or, or chaos increases with time. So if this whole theory of evolution holds any water, right, which means we as human beings, we as, you know, we, we started as a mass of cells, and then we became a tadpole, and then we became a frog, and uh, somehow along the way we became monkeys, and then monkeys eventually became uh, mankind. Stephen Hawking said, disorder always increases with time. So how could humankind improve over millions and millions of years when their science says the longer something exists, the less it becomes? Make any sense? Like the argument about human progress, it indicates that there must have been a beginning. Otherwise, the universe would be in a state of complete disorder by now, and everything would be at the same temperature. Now, Stephen Hawking uh, gave this public lecture, and this is where Ray Comfort's drawing it from, but you can Google this and just Google public lecture, Stephen Hawking, Hawking and it's called The Beginning of Time. So here's somebody who, who is a believer of the Big Bang Theory, and yet his very arguments don't support the science of what he's saying. In other words, everything material degenerates. Think about it. Food rots metal rusts, and rocks eventually crumble into dust. So if the universe had been around forever, i.e. trillions and trillions and trillions of years, everything material would have already turned to dust. Therefore, it must have had a beginning. Now, I'm really excited for Ken Ham, uh, who created the Creation Museum, uh, as well as the Ark Encounter exhibit. As you guys know, he's going to be speaking at the Bold Conference um, this coming November, November 23. And he has done so much research and digging as it relates to the beginning of the earth. Now, non-believing scientists want to tell us, and this is even in our textbooks in public school, that the earth is millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of years old. But it can't be millions and millions and millions and millions of years old because things do not get better over time. Things rot and, and become less than over time. I mean, think about it. Do you feel better? Uh, today than you did 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago? Are you as vibrant and full of energy today than you were 50 years ago? Probably not, okay? Why? Because we age and things don't improve over time. Things get worse over time, not better. God, on the other hand, is not material. Now, the Bible states that God is spirit. So a verse to reference here is John chapter 24, verse 24. Write that down for my note takers. John 4, verse 24 says this, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. God is spirit. He is the essence of life itself. He is the creator of life and is invisible as is life. And God is immortal, which means he cannot be touched by death. And he is infinite and eternal, which means there is no beginning or end as it relates to God. He exists outside the dimensions of time, which he created. Go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. 
Hang a left in your Bible and go to Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. See, this is in the beginning of earth, not in the beginning of God. God was already here, existing as a spirit. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning of the earth, the creation of the atmosphere, verse 2, now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. Uh, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it, and it was so. And God, God called the expanse sky, and there was evening, and there was morning on the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear, and it was so. Now, it is believed by Bible scholars and teachers, Ken Ham being one of the uh, biggest advocates of this, is that the world itself is about 6,000 years old. So all of this carbon dating stuff, where things are millions and millions and millions of years old, no. 6,000 years from the beginning, not the beginning of God, but the beginning of earth. <clears throat> Verse 5. My sword has drunk its fill in the heavens. See, it descends in judgment on Edom and the people I have totally destroyed. Now, Edom is a <clears throat> interesting reference here. Because it was the Edomites who shared a common ancestry with Israel. Now, remember, the Israelites were descended from Jacob. Jacob had a twin brother named Esau. And es Esau is where uh, Esau, Jacob's brother, settled in the land of Edom. So Edom represents an enemy of Israel. Now, the destruction of Edom mentioned here is a picture of the ultimate end of all who oppose God and his people. So, again, for my note takers here in verse 5, you want to underline Edom, okay? Edom is the land of Esau, and it represents all non-believers. Because if you are a non-believer, then you are against God. If you are a believer, you are for God. So, Jacob for God, Esau against God, okay? So Edom is going to be totally destroyed during this period. And again, this is in reference to all those who do not know God, who refuse to accept or acknowledge or believe in God. Verse 6, the sword of the Lord is bathed in blood, and it is covered with fat, the blood of lambs and goats, fat from the kidneys of rams, for the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra and a great slaughter in Edom. Now, Basra refers to the ancient area of Edom. This is southeast of Israel, and it is what is now present-day Saudi Arabia, okay? So think about this uh, in relation to the map, okay? So here we have Israel. Uh, east, northeast of Jerusalem is Armageddon, or, or Megiddo, where the Battle of Armageddon will take place. Now we're going to travel a little further east and drop south on the other side of the Jordan River, and now we are in modern-day Saudi Arabia. Edom is the area where Jacob's brother Esau settled. Now, in Romans chapter 9, verse 13, it's the Lord said this. He says, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Now, why does the Lord say that? Why, why does the Lord doesn't hate anybody? Well, that's not true. The Lord hates anybody who doesn't love him. So he says, I love Jacob. I hate Esau. Why? Because Esau was a carnal, material man who was more interested in a bowl of food than in his birthright. He was more concerned with pampering his flesh than he was in walking with God. Now, you guys remember the story. Esau, you know, the big rugged, hairy mountain man, has been out hunting. He comes home. Jacob, who's kind of a mama's boy, was home cooking soup. Esau comes in and he says, hey, Jacob, give me some of that soup. And Jacob, you know, being the conniver, he says, yeah, sure, Esau, I'll happily give you some of my soup, but I need you to give me your birthright. Now, the birthright in the family line, when you're the firstborn male, you inherit everything from dad, right? So all of dad's stuff transfers to the firstborn male. And Esau says, yeah, you know what? I could care less about the birthright. Give me the soup. I'm starving. Now, the correlation here is for us, 
who choose the things of the world over the things of God. Now, when do we do that? We do that, number one, when we choose not to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, when we choose to deny that God exists, when we choose to believe in uh, the Big Bang Theory over the creation truth. Um, we do that when we make our, our business the great priority. Uh, we do this when we make money more important than our walk with the Lord, when we work instead of going to church, when we uh, fill our time with you know, pornography and, and unrighteous living instead of walking with the Lord. So anytime a, a human being chooses wealth and pleasure and partying and all of the things that are against the Bible, then they are referred to as an Edomite or a non-believer. When we choose to walk with the Lord, we now gain the birthright of inheriting the Father's kingdom and spending an eternity in the mansions that our Father is creating for us right now as we speak. Isn't that exciting? I think that's pretty cool. But Esau chose the things of the world as opposed to the things of his Father. And that's where this reference to Basra comes in and the Edomites here in modern-day Saudi Arabia. Verse 7, and the wild oxen will fall with them, the bull calves and the great bulls. Their land will be drenched with blood and the dust will be soaked with fat. For the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of retribution to uphold Zion's cause. Now, Edom's streams will be turned into pitch. Now, pitch is referred to as crude oil. Okay, Remember, we're in Saudi Arabia, a very, very oil-rich country. And here the reference that Isaiah is giving is that the streams will be turned into pitch and the dust into burning sulfur. How can it turn into burning sulfur? Well, if the sand and the oil mix together, then it's something that can just burn continuously forever and ever and ever. Verse 8, for the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of retribution. Uh, verse 9, Edom streams will be turned into pitch, her dust into burning sulfur, and her land will become blazing pitch. It will not be quenched night and day. Its smoke will rise forever. For generation to generation, it will lie desolate, and no one will ever pass through it again. Now, for years, Bible scholars wondered, how could an area burn forever? Well, now we know. If a bomb or some other device were to ignite the vast oil reserves of Saudi Arabia, they would literally burn forever. Whether a bomb ignites them or they are ignited supernaturally, they could be ignited by a bomb. I believe that we will see nuclear war during this Great Tribulation period. And if somebody does drop a nuclear bomb, this area of the Middle East could literally burn forever. Think about that. The, the, the trillions and trillions of gallons of crude oil under the surface of the earth now raise to the surface. The streams become oil. That's what that pitch is referring to. And here now, these fires that go on forever and ever is the fires continue to burn the oil. Now, verse 8 tells us that it is the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. That is, the region of the world has historically brought real pain to God's people in Israel. So this is retribution for the earth coming against Israel. Remember, uh, we talked a few weeks ago about Israel being one of the, uh, the only area in the world that has been attacked more than any other plot of ground that exists on this planet. Over 22 times, Israel has been attacked. Hmm. So pretty interesting. I mean, when you think about Isaiah's writing this thousands and thousands of years ago, probably before oil had even been discovered or, or what oil could be used for outside of um, burning lamps. But it says it will not be quenched night and day. Its smoke will burn forever. Pretty interesting. Verse 11. Uh, sorry, uh, a quick reference here about verse 10. Comes from William Booth. Now, William Booth is the founder uh, as well as the first general of the Salvation Army. Now, when I came across when I came across his quote, which I'm going to read you in just a minute, uh, I wanted to know better who this William Booth was. And pretty fascinating guy. If you don't know the the roots of the founding of the Salvation Army, and and you guys are going to hear about this for the next eight weeks, as every store you walk into, they're ringing a bell, right? And that's typically Salvation Army raising money. So. William Booth was the founder of the Salvation Army back in the mid-1800s, and he said this, not called, did you say? Not heard the call, I think you should say. 
He says, put your ear down to the Bible and hear him bid you go and pull sinners out of the fire of sin. Put your ear down to the burdened, agonized heart of humanity and listen to its pitiful wail for help. Go stand by the gates of hell and hear the damned entreat you to go to their father's house and bid their brothers and sisters and servants and masters not to come there. And then look Christ in the face, whose mercy you have professed to obey, and tell him whether you will join heart and soul and body and circumstance in the march to publish his mercy to the world. Wow, Isn't that a powerful statement. Put your ear to the Bible. And hear him bid you go and pull sinners out of the fire of sin. Wow. Boy. Now we know where the Salvation Army comes from. I mean, William Booth took this charge seriously. And he took this warning seriously. And he developed an army to battle people who are not walking with the Lord, living a sinful lifestyle, and refuse to acknowledge that God is the creator of the universe, that he sent his son Jesus as a sacrifice because we can't earn our way to heaven. And it was Jesus's blood and death and resurrection that we now all have the hope of a future in heaven when we simply acknowledge and accept and receive his free gift of salvation by saying, Jesus, I believe in you. And I acknowledge that you are the creator of the universe. I acknowledge that you died on the cross for me. And I want you to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And then we begin walking with him. What does walking with the Lord look like? Well, one, it means wanting to know everything you can possibly know about him. Studying the Bible, going to church, going to men's retreats, going to ladies retreats, going on mission trips, all of these things, right? You will know them by their fruit. And does the fruit that you produce say, I love Jesus? Or does the fruit that you produce, this is the outcome of your efforts. Does it produce fruit in, in the form of, Loving people, serving others, giving of yourself, of your time, of your money. These are all the fruits of a Christian, of a believer, somebody who truly understands and believes that Jesus loves them. Or as we look at our lives, is, is our lives made up of jumping from this job to that job, to this relationship, to that relationship, from this marriage to that marriage, constantly seeking uh, acceptance, constantly seeking companionship, constantly seeking money or wealth or, or, or having the nicest, most luxurious things, all the while forsaking any time spent with the Lord. You will know them by their works. Now, it's not our place to judge who is and who is not a Christian. God knows, and you know, right? As you look at your own effort, as you look at the output of your life, would you say that there's anything that suggests you love Jesus? Or has your life up to this point been pretty focused on getting ahead, making more, having more, being more? Now, again, I don't want to step over into legalism here. God has told us to work. I mean, the first thing he gave Adam to do was work. Hey, Adam, I just created you. Now I need you to take care of the garden. Tend to it. Be a good steward of it. I believe that God has given every single one of us a garden called our, our career, called our business, called our job that we are to tend to and be a good steward of, but only for God's glory, not for our own elevation, not for our own outcome, right? Uh, he who dies with the most toys wins, right? No. He who dies with the most toys still dies. Question is, do they die and ascend to heaven because they spent their time on this earth making God their priority? Or do they go to hell when they die because they spent no time on this earth acknowledging that God even existed? And they spent their days trying to prove or justify that God didn't exist. You know, some of these atheists from uh, Darwin to Hawking, boy, it is going to be a very interesting day for them on Judgment Day when they meet God. And they are going to be ushered in to an introduction with the creator of the universe, the very creator that they spent their lives trying to prove didn't exist. And in the meantime, steered millions, if not billions of people away from ever having a relationship with Jesus. <laughs> Boy, those guys have it, have it coming. And it's not just them. I believe that it's any parent who has not accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, who any parent who's said, you know what, I believe in evolution, I don't believe in God, 
And now they've raised up kids who don't believe in God. And now they have grandkids who don't believe in God. I believe those parents, those grandparents, those great, great grandparents are, are going to stand in judgment as well because their failure to accept and acknowledge God has created generations of non-believers. Now, fortunately, God has no grandkids, so every person must decide for themselves, do I accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, or do I deny him? Verse 11, the desert owl and screech owl will possess it. The great owl and the raven will nest there. God will stretch out over Edom, the measuring line of chaos, the plumb line of desolation. Remember, it's just going to be oil fields burning. And the only person that's going to be able to even go in the area is something that can fly. Verse 12, her nobles will have nothing there to be called a kingdom. <laughs> you see some of the ostentatious buildings in the Middle East now? <laughs> I mean, just massive structures will no longer be there. All these rich oil barons and kings of the Middle East, it says that they will not have anything to call a kingdom. All of their princes will vanish away. Thorns will overrun her citadels, nettles and brambles her strongholds, and she will become a haunt for jackals and a home for owls. All of these things that are right now so important to the world, non-believers, disappear and become houses for God's creatures. Verse 14, desert creatures will meet with hyenas and wild goats will bleat to each other. There the night creatures will also repose and find themselves places of rest in these multi-multi-billion dollar mansions created and built only to glorify men. Verse 18 or verse 15, the owl will nest there and lay eggs. She will hatch them and care for her young under the shadow of her wings. There also the falcons will gather each with its mate. Now the Hebrew word translated emptiness is B-O-H-U-W or bohu. It's the same word we see in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, which again says, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So this word emptiness that we see in verse 15, or verses 11 through 15, are, is here to describe the state of the earth after Satan fell from heaven. Thus, following the Battle of Armageddon, it is as if the world will come full circle, once again in a state of devastation, waiting for the, re the recreation that only our loving, creative, awesome creator can bring about. Now, this, this earth that's being described here is before the millennial reign of Christ. So this is the condition of the earth before God rejuvenates it during the millennial reign where I believe the earth will look much like it did during Adam and Eve's days, the Garden of Eden. I believe that during the millennial reign, that's what the earth will look like. But this is what it looks like after this terrible battle of Armageddon. Verse 16, look in the scroll of the Lord and read, none of these will be missing. Not one will lack its mate for it is his mouth that is given the order, and his spirit will gather them together. Now, Isaiah referred to the prophecies that God commanded him to write down as the book of the Lord, or the scroll. Look in the scroll of the Lord, is what Isaiah is saying. And he's saying, whoever lived to see the time of Edom's destruction would have to only look to these prophecies to find agreement between what happened and what was predicted. Prophecy predicts and history reveals what has been in God's mind all of the time. Now, I believe that when the church is raptured, and if you've never seen the Left Behind series with Kirk Cameron, it's like 30 years old, watch it again, because I believe they depict this really well, where all of the Christians ascend to heaven, were taken out of the earth before this seven-year tribulation period occurs, and the earth is going to be very confused. Where did billions of people disappear to? And they're going to make up all of these things, and they're going to say aliens took them. And I believe that even alien invasion and all of these, these you know, people who saw uh, an alien ship, I believe this is all Satan's way of just kind of preparing the non-believers for the narrative that during the rapture that it was aliens who took all of the Christians off the face of the earth. But then, you know, everything's going to get really good. So all the Christians leave, billions of people disappear. That's going to leave all of this, all of these houses and all of this inheritance as it transfers from the believers to the non-believers, uh, parents who were saved, uh, all of that wealth when they ascend into heaven will stay here on earth. You don't take any of it with you. And it'll transfer to these non-believing kids who didn't get taken. 
And it's going to be this euphoric time for three and a half years. It's going to be peace on earth. And people are going to think, oh, thank the Lord for taking those Christians out of here. Clearly, they were the problem because look at what's happened in three and a half years since they left. It's been, it's been euphoric. And then the Antichrist, who will have done an amazing job, you know, assembling all of the world to unite together under one cause of peace and harmony, will then claim himself to be God right there on the Temple Mount and demand that the world worship him and that will be the beginning of the second half of the tribulation period this three and a half year reign and it ends in this great armageddon battle which is the condition the earth is left in as we see it here in isaiah 34. now the earth is going to be spinning going what in the world just happened and what isaiah is saying here in verse 16 he's saying all you guys had to do was open the bible everything was told to you everything was predicted that's what a prophecy is he's telling the future and yet, how many people choose not to believe it? Isaiah claimed God's authority for his own word and reminded the people that when the fulfillment came, they could simply return to the book of the Lord as and see that it was all written down and given to us by God. How can you say that God is unloving? How can you say that God is a God of, of, of wrath? Warning after warning after warning after warning. Thousands of years we have had these passages. And yet, how many people have chosen to reject God and die in sin to spend an eternity in hell? Nobody should spend any time in hell, ever. The Bible says that God would see, God would prefer that none should perish, but all should come to know him as Lord and Savior. Verse 17, he allots their portions, his hand distributes them by measure. They will possess it forever and dwell there from generation to generation. Here the Lord says, it's all going to happen, just as I declare. So the application, when you see a little leaf fall from a tree, you can attempt to glue it back on the branch, but it won't stay and it won't live. Just as surely judgment is coming and you can't keep it from coming. There's only one thing you can do, and that is to make sure that you have a shelter. Listen to God and remember that the Lord Jesus is the shelter in the time of the storm, which is coming upon the earth. Now, I came across, across a headline, and the headline says this, and this is from the infamous hurricane. If you guys remember Hurricane Camille, uh, which hit the U.S. Uh, East Coast on August 17th of 1969. Now, a group of 23 people lived in an apartment building called the Camille Apartments, and they decided that the coming hurricane wasn't actually going to hit where they were located. So when they heard about this hurricane and, and everybody was being evacuated, they decided, you know what, we're not leaving. We're going to stay right here because we don't believe that this hurricane is going to happen. And they literally laughed in the face of the storm. And they decided to throw a kegger and get drunk instead. Now, you guys can research this. This is uh, Hurricane Camille. Um, and this is the... Um, uh, the party. So you can just Google the infamous Hurricane Camille party. Uh, Walter Cronkite did a big piece about this. There's a there's a movie that was done about this very story. But these 23 people, instead of uh, buttoning down the hatches, you know, uh, moving to higher ground, getting out of the face of the storm, they decided to get drunk instead, and they refused to leave. So as the hurricane hits the coast and the floods come, it took them and shoved them all in the apartment building, which then was pushed off of its foundation, and every single one of them died. They ridiculed the storm, and as a result, when the storm hit, as promised, they were all killed. Now, people are doing the same thing concerning the judgment that is coming on this earth. The judgment is coming. Question is, will you heed the warnings and confess of your sin and accept Christ, or will you laugh in the face of the storm and instead throw a party? It is wise to read the weather report, and when you see that there's the storm in the forecast, make arrangements to escape it. I mean, here in chapter 34, God is giving us the weather report for the coming storm. Question is, will you heed the headlines, or will you laugh in the faces of it, or will you simply say, it won't affect us? Now, as I was reading this story, I thought about a few weeks ago when I was heading down to Tampa before uh, Hurricane, I think it was Ian, uh, hit the Gulf Coast, Fort Myers, uh, Cape Coral, uh, that whole area, Tampa. I mean, it was bad. 
And I saw the headlines and I thought, eh, maybe I'll go. And then I got a, a text from a friend and he said, Lee, are you going to Tampa? And I said, yeah, why? He said, I wouldn't. He said, I, I live, I lived in Florida on the East Coast. That's why I moved inland. I don't want to be anywhere near that storm. And I thought, you know what? He's probably right. And you guys prayed for me and you prayed, Lord, give me wisdom. And so I didn't go. And that storm did hit. But a lot of people still went. A lot of people got stuck down there, trapped in the storm. Thank the Lord, I had a friend who cared enough about me to send a text, and he said, don't go. Guys, there's a storm coming, and we just read about it, and we all have friends that are sitting right smack dab in the path of the storm because they refuse to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. I want to challenge each and every one of us this morning to send a text to a friend and just let them know there's a storm coming. It's called the judgment of God. And if you don't know Jesus, when this happens, you will spend an eternity in hell. Be a friend. Send a text. The storm is coming. Second Peter verse three, chapter 3, verse 10 says that the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Why is God waiting? Because God is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. How much longer God will wait? Nobody knows. So it behooves lost sinners to repent today and trust the Savior. Now, for those of us who have accepted Christ, will we spend the rest of our lives on this earth getting the warning out? Or will we let friends, family, and loved ones die in the storm and spend eternity in the eternal lake of fire? Oh, how I pray that we would take this seriously and preach it to everyone. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you this morning with this sobering reminder that this storm is coming. And Lord, we don't necessarily know when, but we know that it is. Lord, everything in your word that has been prophesied up to this point has come true. And this will as well. Lord, I pray that we would not be soft-spoken or complacent Christians. Lord, that we would live our lives comfortable in the reality and the fact that we know you and we have a personal relationship with you and that we will not go through this storm and that we will spend an eternity in heaven with you, but rather, Lord, we would spend our lives warning others of this coming storm. Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you, Lord, for the truth that no one will breathe their last breath without hearing the truth of the gospel and no one will breathe their last breath without either making a decision for you or against you. And Lord, I pray that anybody who's watching this right now, who has been wrestling with whether or not you are, you are true and you are faithful and that you are just and that you are righteous and that you are real, Lord, I pray that they would heed this warning, take it seriously, and get right with you before they die. And Lord, I pray for those of us that know you, that we would heed this warning and recognize that it's real and it's true and it's going to happen. And we would urgently be getting the message out. So Lord, I pray for each and every one of us, for those that don't know you, to come to know you. And for those of us that do, to be urgent about sharing this with others. Lord, thank you for your truth. Thank you for this warning. Lord, thank you for uh, reminding us the hurricane's coming. And we need to be right with you when it hits. Lord, we love you. We thank you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, if anybody needs prayer, we would love to pray with you. Uh, you can reach us on our prayer line at 800-461-0216. Uh, and remember, guys, we, we, um, we introduced the Unreachables at the Bold Conference a few weeks ago. And the Unreachables is a, uh, it's a monthly mailing where you can put somebody into our system, somebody that you don't believe is walking with the Lord, a friend or a family member or a loved one uh, who you want to hear the word. Uh, you can put them into our Unreachables campaign. Donna or Amy, if one of you could put the link uh, in the chat here where people can go to sign up, friends and family who don't know the Lord. Now, what they're, they're going to get uh, tracks on a monthly basis. They're going to get emails on a monthly basis. Uh, we're going to ship them a Bible. And all of these things are going to happen knowing or believing that they are not walking with the Lord. I have friends and family that Jacqueline and I have witnessed to, and they're just not heeding it. And so maybe they need a different, they need to hear it from somebody else. So we've put together a, um, a campaign called The Unreachables. Uh, and for $25 a month, we will send them literature and tracks about the love of God, the wrath of God, the coming judgment, 
because God doesn't want to see anybody perish and go to hell. And I don't want to see anybody per perish and go to hell. So we've created this specifically to help you guys witness to friends and family. So I would encourage you uh, to go check that out. It's called The Unreachables uh, at He's the Solution Ministries.org. Okay. So check that out. And maybe together, uh, your efforts, our efforts, perhaps we can uh, help them see the truth and come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. So be in prayer about that and about them. Uh, and um, you guys have a wonderful week. Uh, if we're still here next week, Lord willing, uh, we'll pick up our study in Isaiah chapter 35. Until then, God bless you guys. Have a great week. Talk to you soon. Goodbye, everybody.